is 601, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, good evening. This is our, my name is Maggie Ray, and I'll be co-hosting. Uh, thank you for joining us this evening for the Beginning Gardener series. Tonight's presentation will be a two-hour long presentation on succession and companion planting. During the program, please stay muted the whole time and do not share any video. As usual, if you have any questions for the presenter during the program, please type those into the chat box. And if you have any technical questions regarding Zoom, please put those in the chat box as well. This session will be split into two. Questions for our first presenter will be asked at the end of um, her one hour long session. So make sure you get those questions for our first presenter in there before her hour is up. Um, and that might also be a good time for us for you to take a break if you need to. I think we'll take about 10, 10 12 minutes but before we go to the next presenter. Um, once again, if you have any of those technical questions, please put those in the chat box. Also in the chat box is my email. If you need to email me for something. Um, our first presenter is Katie Bell. Katie is um, a University of Illinois Extension Local Food and Small Farms Educator in Southern Illinois. She covers Jackson, Franklin, Williamson, Randolph, and Perry County. Uh, with that, I'll let her take it away. Hi everybody and good evening. We are on our um, was it fourth installment, fifth installment of the uh, Beginning Gardener series. Uh, and this is companion and succession planning. And to start off the night, I am going to start uh, talking a little bit about succession planning and kind of what that is and how we can use it to our advantages in our home gardens. So we use succession plantings to prolong harvests. Um, so a succession planting is where you put out multiple uh, plantings of the same or even different crops. Uh, most of what I will be referring to tonight will be uh, talking about the same uh, crop in succession. Um, so we use this to, to prolong our harvesting period or harvestability because most of the plants used in succession plantings have short harvest windows where maybe you only get two or three weeks of really productive fruiting uh, before they kind of die back. And so this way we kind of can get a bump out of them. Another thing that we can do is kind of avoid this feast or famine that happens so that, that way um, if we plant our field full of green beans, for example, all at one time, they're all going to come ripe and uh, ready all at the same time. And then we're going to be uh, sort of buried under a mountain of green beans. Whereas if we do a, a succession planting and we we plant maybe a third of the field to start with, and then two weeks later we put out new plants, and then two weeks later we put out more plants. This way, um, a third of the field will be coming ripe every two weeks, and so that that way um, we'll harvest for about two weeks and then be ready to move on to the next third and so on and so forth. So this really kind of evens out our harvestability and gives us a nice steady crop instead of big bursts and then nothing. Um, we can kind of avoid disease issues or kind of skirt around uh, happening to, to fight them so heavily um, because we can tear out uh, plants that are starting to get diseased or, or having significant insect damage and then just replace them uh, with, with new plants. Uh, this does not uh, eradicate disease from your field or anything. It just kind of helps us avoid the issue um, with these particular plants. Um, and then you can also kind of maximize your growing, your small growing areas. If you, if you divide an area into thirds, for example, as you are reaching the end of, of your planting, of your getting onto your third planting, you could have started over at the beginning. And so you can kind of just work in a circle around your, your area and that kind of helps to maximize your space. So to have a successful uh, succession planting, as I had mentioned before, you're gonna wanna be planting every two to four weeks depending on the crop that you choose. Most of these have, as I said before, harvest windows um, of about two, two to three weeks, two to four weeks, depending again on the crop. Um, you're gonna wanna only use a portion of the field at a time. So that's kind of up to you how much you want to harvest at one time or how long you want your uh, harvest window to be. Um, thirds or fourths is kind of just a good uh, rule of thumb, but it also has to do uh, with your space. And then um, you want to remove any plants that are old or unproductive, and then you can replace them with new plants. 
one thing to keep in mind is that you want to feed your soil throughout the season since we are putting in new plants uh, quite frequently they're going through their life cycle and they are um, setting fruit and doing um, all of their necessary uh, processes and that's going to require extra bursts of nutrients that the same plants throughout the season wouldn't necessarily require. So you want to you want to make sure that you're providing them with enough nutrients to to boost those harvests and uh, and you want to get good flower set which will in turn lead to good fruit set and fruit quality for any of the plants that we would be using uh, throughout the season. You also want to make sure that you have enough seed to get you through the season so that that way if you are starting seeds that you're going to be planting out, you are going to want to make sure that you have enough seed uh, to get you through the season. And again with this, um, the planting every two to four weeks, you're going to want to make sure that you start seeds in the same manner so that that way if you are um, starting seeds in a, in a greenhouse or in a protected area, you're going to want to start those on a, on a two-week cycle. Uh, some plants, especially within the uh, cucurbit family, so uh, cucumbers or any of your squashes, they will be able to kind of hold in pots a little bit better than some of your other uh, things like like greens or, or lettuces. Lettuces will tend to, to bolt if they get too crowded and they can also turn off bitter uh, if they get hot. So you kind of want to keep that in mind and uh, with with lettuces or kale or spinach, you're going to want to be uh, mindful of whenever you plant them or whenever you seed them to make sure that you can get them out in a timely manner uh, because they don't hold as well in, in seed trays. They want to be in the ground um, as soon as they can within that, that window. So good crops for succession systems. I kind of miss, uh, mentioned a few, but you're kind of looking for something that has, you know, a short harvest period or maybe a one-time harvest. So something like like let it head lettuce or um, your carrots, beets, turnips. Those are all things that you're going to be harvesting one time. And so if you don't want to just have one heavy overload, um, this is a good crop to consider for succession because you can have a, a steady supply of them throughout your growing season. Um, something that's gonna be setting, having uh, large bursts of fruit sets. I have seen growers, um, have heard of growers that will even uh, determinate tomatoes. They will um, do succession plantings of them um, and have separate, separate fields where they will move on to another field and then plant something um, that's short season in the area. So they're not replacing it with the same crop but they are um, utilizing the space after those plants are done. And you also want something that's quick growing and can rebound quickly whenever you transplant it into the field. Um, another way that you can do manage succession systems is to use different maturity groups of the same crop. So this is slightly different than tearing plants out and replacing them or leaving part of your field uh, open in the beginning. Um, you could plant everything out at the same time. So for example, um, certain kinds of green beans have, and peas have different maturity groups. So some mature uh, pretty rapidly and have a short number of days before they're ready to harvest. And then others have longer um, maturity days. So that way you could plant everything at the same time and then your early maturing varieties will be ready early in the season then and as you move through, you will still have a steady supply of uh, fresh and healthy plants. So just kind of to look at, at some of the specific plants. Um, sorry about that. Uh, green beans and peas are one that we see a lot for succession plantings because green beans, um, they, they have a really heavy uh, pod set for about two weeks and they can be harvested every every day to every other day and the same with peas and then they are pretty well spent so if you want to have a steady supply for more than a couple of weeks you're going to want to go ahead and try to set up some sort of succession system um, lettuce as i had mentioned before um, arugula kale spinach swiss chard these are all good things uh, to plant in a succession the lettuce because 
for the fact that you're often planting uh, head lettuce. So once you harvest that head, it won't regrow um, typically. Um, and then kale and spinach and Swiss chard, you can just harvest the leaves and then have the plant there and they'll regenerate. But after so long, they start to get uh, kind of bolty or the leaves start to get tough. And then you have a lot of old stems left over. So it's a good idea to have some fresh plantings. And then as I had mentioned before, the beets and uh, radishes and carrots and turnips are also going to be a, kind of a one-time uh, harvest crop unless you're harvesting some of them for the, for example, for beets or uh, turnips harvesting the greens. Um, herbs are also a good candidate for, for succession systems if you're planning on harvesting them um, all in one batch. So if, if you come through and just cut the whole uh, plant instead of just taking a few leaves at a time, you could have uh, succession plantings of, of herbs. Um, squash or uh, zucchini and any of the squashes, they tend to get uh, powdery mildew, short, if they're, especially if they're on the ground or planted really close together, so, and they also grow quickly, so they're something that could be fairly easily done for, for a succession planting or planted in a series because um, they'll take, take up the space and take over pretty quickly after you uh, transplant them. So these are just some examples, some pictures of different crops um, that are good uh, candidates for succession planting. So as you can see, the green beans here, they've just kind of uh, taken over. And um, another with green beans, you could use either pole beans or you can use bush beans and they um, will both work pretty well for, for this kind of system. Uh, this is some head lettuce, as you can see, um, that would be harvested and then it, it won't regrow and, and just carrots. And then this is basil done on, on black plastic. So along with uh, succession planning, our main goal is kind of to try to, to extend our, our season and get, you know, kind of our, the most bang for our buck, um, trying to get, uh, get the most out of our harvest season, the most out of our space. And so another thing that we can do um, is to kind of get a jump on our, our season and uh, reach beyond what we normally would be able to with our, our climate and our weather. Um, so we can use some different uh, season extension uh, techniques. So these are used to extend the harvest period both later into the fall and then also to be able to start earlier in the spring. And a couple of different uh, methods would be planting on, on black plastic mulch uh, using row covers both inside the tunnels and outside um, and then also low tunnels um, outside though you could also use them inside if you wanted to try to maximize uh, heat conservation and then also using uh, cold frame high tunnels. Uh, so this is uh, some new black plastic that we actually just laid recently um, and we will be planting tomatoes on this. Um, Black plastic is really good for, for a couple of different reasons. One thing that, especially in a season extension aspect, is using plastic to kind of warm the soil up earlier than it normally would. And um, this kind of gives our, our plants, our small plants, a boost. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that if you are using it late in the fall or in, in the middle of the summer, um, it can get too hot for things that don't have um, a large canopy. So, so some of your lower to the ground um, greens or spinach, they can kind of uh, suffer from being too hot. And so that is one drawback. But if you're using, um, if you're planting something that grows uh, pretty rapidly and gets a pretty rapid canopy, after a few weeks, it will help protect the roots and provide enough shade that the plastic shouldn't interfere uh, with heating the roots too much. So this is black plastic on a, on a raised bed. This is actually a, a trial that one of my colleagues is doing uh, down at the uh, Dixon Springs Ag Center. And they, they actually did a season extension trial on using greens and, um, and succession plantings. So these were, 
all planted on the same date, but as you can see, and this was one of the earlier plantings whenever it was really hot. So you can see that the plastic has actually stunted um, the growth of, of the lettuce and even the kale, you can see it's really slowed it down. Um, whereas these that were all planted on the same day, these have gotten uh, quite a bit bigger. Uh, this was actually the opposite later whenever it was colder. So the stuff on the plastic actually got bigger faster uh, due to the heat conservation and heat capture that we were able to get from the plastic. So these are uh, row covers used inside of a high tunnel. This was again part of the same trial. And so the covers were applied, um, I believe whenever it got below 23, whenever the outside temperature was gonna be 23 degrees or lower at night, the sides on the tunnel were closed and then uh, row covers were applied uh, to help uh, protect the plants from frost damage. And then it also, uh, seemed like the plants that were covered were able to grow a bit bigger than than the ones that were not covered. So row covers are something that you can use inside of a, of a high tunnel or a greenhouse, but they can also be used outside. Uh, but one thing to keep in mind with using covers outside is that just you wanna make sure that you pin them down really well uh, or weight them down with either uh, maybe metal T-posts or cinder blocks or bricks to keep them from blowing away if it gets windy at night. So these are, this is a, a low tunnel that's built over an outside raised bed. Um, low tunnels are, are really good to, to add to that season extension so you can get a jump on, on uh, the season or maybe go later into the fall. Uh, one thing with them is because they're close to the ground and outside, um, just like a regular high tunnel, you're gonna wanna make sure that you vent them whenever it does get uh, warm outside or direct sunlight because it can get very hot in there if it's closed up. So you want to make sure that you have a good way to, to vent them um, and allow for airflow so that that way too much heat doesn't build up. Um, again, with just like the, the row covers being used outside, you want to make sure that you have a way to pin down the edges of your, of your low tunnel because you don't want the wind coming through and carrying your plastic away or um, getting a hold of it and shredding it. So these are high tunnels and they're really uh, useful tools for season extension as well. And they can help you get a jump on uh, your succession plantings and just uh, getting a jump on the season in general. They provide uh, kind of an ideal growing space. The only thing to keep in mind is that because they don't receive any rain, you can have issues with salt buildup from fertilizers that are applied. So you kind of want to make sure that you flush the beds every once in a while with good water. Um, <clears throat> if you can, maybe once or twice a season. And then also during the heat of the summer, it can actually have um, kind of an opposite effect to what you would normally want. Um, it gets too hot oftentimes for uh, your greens to be grown or even strawberries to be grown in something like a high tunnel. Uh, this, this particular tunnel has a, has a shade cloth applied that does help um, block some of that light and keep the temperatures down slightly so that that way it doesn't get too hot in there. Um, the, uh, so that is um, what I was going to talk about with the succession planning. And then this is uh, the this planting method is kind of a combination between uh, a succession planting and then also using a companion system. So this is the three sisters method. Uh, some of you may have heard of it. It's a traditional uh, Native American planting technique, and I believe it was uh, originally started by the Iroquois tribe. Um, so it's a companion system that historically has used corn, some sort of climbing bean, and then uh, a, some sort of squash plant or, or cucurbit to, to grow together and be beneficial to each other. Uh, one good thing about these beneficial crops is that they provide, uh, they can multiple crops, multiple different crops from different families can attract uh, lots of different pollinators. And so that can be beneficial uh, 
to all of the planting systems. So uh, this is just kind of a, a, a good graphic of the uh, Three Sisters planting system. Uh, so the corn provides a trellis uh, for the for a climbing bean. So you want to have um, a really, and I will get into this just a little bit later. You want to have a really tall, uh, sturdy variety of corn crop of corn uh, that's taller typically than what you would would think of of, of a sweet corn. Um, and then some sort of climbing bean that. Uh, then beans, because they're leguminous, they uh, have the capabilities to fix nitrogen in the soil. And then the squash plant is able to provide a living mulch for both weed control and shade. And then um, the prickly kind of nature of the leaves, uh, some of the things that I had read said that they are good at protecting against certain uh, four-legged pests. So raccoons may not necessarily want to come through that uh, that that mess of uh, squash vine to get to your corn or your beans. Um, and you can use variations of this planting to meet your needs. So it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, squash. You could use any kind of cucurbit vine. You maybe could mix it up and try watermelons or, or pumpkins or even cucumbers, just depending on your area and how much space you have. Uh, so how to plant, you want to plant a tall corn variety, as I had mentioned, again, after the last frost date in your area. Um, and you are, so so this could be a, a tall, you're probably going to be looking at tall dent varieties or Indian corn. Um, you might want to look into different heirloom varieties. They're going to be better suited for this type of planting. And you will plant, um, these are typically done in a mound system, but you can kind of change it up and see how it suits your needs. Um, you are going to plant, you're going to make a mound, a, a light hill in the ground or in your garden. And then a, most of the plantings that I've seen are you plant four corn plants six inches apart. And then after three weeks, um, or whenever you feel that your your corn has emerged and is tall enough, you're going to want to plant a climbing some sort of climbing bean, uh, whether this is a pole bean or any variety of of dried beans. Um, so after three weeks, you will plant that, and that gives the corn enough time that by the time the the bean has emerged, it will be able to trellis the corn without uh, choking it out. And then after a week after your beans have emerged. And have and you feel like they're growing good you want to plant your uh, cucurbit or your squash for your living mulch and then those will grow together and um, you can harvest them together and that's a really good beneficial system and for the one thing I do want to note about the the nitrogen fixing with the beans um, that may take more than one season to take an effect so so you may not see a, a boost right away but if you do this planting uh, more than one season in a row, you're going to see some effects of that of that nitrogen fixing. So just some concluding thoughts to kind of go over. Um, succession plantings can provide a steady harvest throughout the season, so it really levels out that that uh, harvesting season and that big burst of uh, planting or even kind of overload that you might be overwhelmed with. This can kind of help you may not harvest as much at one time, but you'll harvest more throughout the whole season. Uh, using different season extension techniques and, and structures can kind of further increase your productivity and lengthen your growing season. Um, and then the Three Sisters planting system uses natural attributes of each crop to benefit each other. So it, this is just a good example of using different companion plants and kind of just a good jumping off point to see where you can combine plants together and um, and then kind of get this really beneficial outcome. So these are two websites. This first one talks about, uh, it has some really good resources for growing uh, a Three Sisters garden. And then this uh, has some really good information about different plants that are, are useful in succession plantings. So are there any questions? Yes, we do have a few questions. Okay. Um, 
Okay, what is a row cover made out of? So that is, um, so you could use, as a home gardener, you could use just bed sheets or tablecloths. Um, that is, I don't exactly know what that material is called. I can't remember off the top of my head. There are different thicknesses or weights uh, to them that allow certain amounts of light permeation. Um, but I cannot remember the, the exact name for that. I can't either. No, um, yeah. <laughs> I know it's a, I know sometimes it can be a water repelling type fabric. So maybe like a, is it polyester or something yeah, like wanna, that? Uh, yeah, it's, it's usually, I mean, it's usually an artificial fabric of some kind because you don't want it to, to collect. I know that, yeah, it's water repelling because you don't want it to collect or hold moisture from, from the outside or from the inside as the plants kind of breathe and release water because you don't want it to get musty or moldy under there. Yeah. If you leave it on. Yep. Okay. So we had another question about row covers and it said, do you have any suggestions um, or recommendations or suggestions regarding what uh, model or, or type of row cover to buy and where those might be purchased? Uh, so I think is on. I know that you can, oh, we got um, someone unmuted. Okay. There we go. I got him. Um, like I said, for, for at home, if you're only covering a, a small area, you could just use uh, tablecloths or, or a bed sheet or something to kind of, that, that will work um, for, for that, those needs. Um, as far as the actual uh, fabric that's used uh, by growers, I believe if you would, if you look at different uh, garden supply websites and things would be a good place to start. I can do a little bit of research and kind of maybe send something out if you need, but I don't have a yeah. exact recommendation off the top of my head. Yeah, my my experiences with the uh, row covers is just, yeah, any garden supply place pretty much has them. Um, well, just look online and uh, it just has to do with when you're using them, like in the summertime are using them to repel insects. So you need a really thin and with a high light you know, it's a lot, a lot of light in there. So that you just need to know what time of year you're kind of using that. Um, so where was I at? Sorry about that. Can you use um, black trash bags, maybe contractor grade temporarily for black plastic to warm the soil or is there a specific type? Oh, that's a really good, that's a really good question. Um, I'm not sure. If you were just using it temporarily, I think um, that it would probably be okay to use, to use like a heavy black trash bag. Um, as long as you pin it down, you want to make sure that you, uh, in the photo of the, with the black plastic on the soil, like this, it's buried under the soil. Um, on the edges and so these have been hilled or mounted so if you were doing this by hand you'd you'd want to you'd want to work it up till it up and then create a hill uh and then pin down the the material with uh soil so i think that if you were using a heavy material that that would work uh at least temporarily okay um you mentioned oh, we've got Sorry about that. I don't know where that's coming from. Okay, so you mentioned that squash could potentially deter raccoons. I see that critters being my biggest issue, or I see the critters being my biggest issue. What alternatives do you utilize? I won't even try corn anymore, but I do like the three sisters idea. So I would say um, one thing I had seen whenever I was researching uh, the three sisters for the, the trellising element or the corn element um, a tall sunflower might work. Um, I've not personally used it, so I don't know, but that was one thing that I had seen. So anything that would grow up uh, pretty tall would work well. Or if you wanted to just do two of the sisters, so just the beans and the squash, maybe you could use um, a, a man-made trellis or, or a post or something for the, for the system to grow on. But I would maybe try sunflowers and see um, how that works, because they would also provide a good sturdy uh, natural trellis. 
Okay, and on a side note, I will add that a good raccoon deterrent that I have seen work for a grower in our area was they set up radios around their corn, their sweet corn patch, and that you have to move them pretty frequently because the raccoons figure it out, but it deters them completely from their patch because they think people are there, but you got to move them because they're real smart. <laughs> Okay, that's and a, so, that's a really good idea. Yeah, I know. I thought so too. Um, yep, someone just said that they had read sunflower amaranth. Um, and then, oh, and if it would take more than one year to potentially fix nitrogen with the three sisters planting, how does that factor in if we are rotating planting? So that's a good uh, question. And with that three sisters uh, link that I had had attached at the end there. Um, they had mentioned that one variation of that is you actually do set up a, a rotation instead of using them um, together in close proximity, you divide your growing area into thirds and you plant it one third uh, corn, one third squash and one third beans. And then you rotate that, you rotate that through. Um, and, uh, and so then that way you would have, eventually you would have a rotation, a three year rotation and then you would also have nitrogen uh, fixing throughout the entire field. And you could even do it so that um, your heaviest feeder, which would be your corn for nitrogen, uh, immediately follows your bean planting. Okay. Thank you, Katie. I think that is all the questions that we have right now. So um, we're done a little early, but that's okay. If um, we want to take a five minute break, if everybody needs to go do something, five, 10 minute, and we will let, um, we will let Austin get ready. And we did have a question about rabbits and I'm sorry, I didn't miss that one. Sorry, Katie, hold on. Um, I can't find it. Oh, are there any methods to deter rabbits in the Three Sisters Garden? That's what someone was asking. That I am not sure. I could see potentially the the squash leaves actually acting as kind of an invitation to rabbits because they like to get under things. Um, if they weren't deterred by the kind of the spikes on the edges of, of a lot of those leaves. Um, so I'm not sure exactly um maybe austin would have some insights on that yeah fences fences, <laughs> fences. yeah definitely about, yeah. sometimes that's about what it takes yeah a short you know a couple of feet of chicken wire or something yeah i would say i have two dogs and since i've gotten them i don't have as many rabbits in the yard anymore so Maybe get some dogs. <laughs> but okay, I guess I think that was the last question. So we'll go ahead. Um, oh, we have can rabbits jump into raised beds? Yes. Yeah, yes. they can. Yes, they can. On that one. <laughs> <laughs> and is chicken wire best for that, Austin? Or it, can that be used if he's still there? Yeah, it, it, well, some kind of barrier. It just depends on. I mean, how high can rabbits jump, you know, like a couple feet, so something like three feet, and if you have some other things around there that maybe they don't want to get into, you know, yeah. the, it's, it's usually not just one thing, it's, it's oftentimes it's, it's things in combination, so you might need something like that, and then something they don't like the smell of, or, you know, some combination. Yeah. Uh, someone suggested marigolds and things like that. Yeah, and, uh, and raised, if you have a raised bed, that if you are have a lot of rabbit issues, you'll want to make sure that you put something underneath the bed so that they don't dig under it. So some sort of, of wire or hardware cloth in the bottom of your raised bed um, or bury it under the, like a few feet, extending a few feet out from the bed and that will keep them from digging down and digging up into your bed because that's another issue that you can have with rabbits. And moles. I'm having a mole problem with that right <laughs> now. They're climbing up through the bottom. Uh, did not, I didn't expect, it's been three years, I haven't had that happen, but okay. Um, oh, I have someone put in there, their rabbits eat their marigolds, so maybe rabbits <laughs> are just, they're just impossible, you know, going to stand out there all night. But um, so we're going to let that, uh, we're going to uh, let that rest for a minute and let Austin go ahead and set up.
uh, and we do actually, I know we have a lot of pr people talking about uh, pests and garden pests. Austin actually has a presentation on our YouTube. Is it on our YouTube channel, Austin? Is it up? The uninvited plant guests. Yeah, on the YouTube, okay. whatever that is, the, the address. I'll send I don't it know. Out. Yeah, I think yeah. it's up there. Yeah, it should okay. be. So you can view that one. And if you guys ever have any questions for any of us, you can email me because I know I've sent my email out a lot to everybody. And I can get you in touch with Katie or Austin um, with any questions you may have. So we'll go ahead and let, um, we'll let Austin get set up. And like I said, just take a five-minute break. <laughs> 